Do you want to know more about how you can eat for better health and longevity and how your diet and lifestyle can play a part in chronic disease? Then you're in the right place. I'm Claire Day. And I'm Daisy Lund. And we are both plant-based doctors with a passion for improving nutritional education. In this podcast, we will bring you all the latest medical evidence on how a plant-based diet can improve your health whilst being kinder to the planet and fairer to the animals that we share it with. Twice a month, we bring you interviews from experts in the field with a focus on an important topic related to plant-based health, all while sharing recipes and food ideas. So welcome to, in a nutshell, the Plant-Based Health Professionals podcast. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode. Hi Claire, how are you? Great, thanks Daisy. How are you? I'm good, yeah. I'm really excited. I've just signed up to the Lifestyle Medicine Diploma. Have you signed up yet? No, not yet, but I will have done by the time people are listening to this episode. So we have such exciting news that the Plant-Based Health Professionals UK have partnered with the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine as we recognise the importance of all six pillars of lifestyle medicine for health outcomes. Yeah, and the partnership means that the plant-based health professionals will be managing the whole certification pathway from registration through to the exam, providing a mixture of in-person and online educational events. Also offering support to candidates as they work towards the, the exam, and that will take place in London on the 29th of November 2024. I don't want to think about it just yet because I haven't sat an exam for such a long time, so I'm going to not think about that quite yet. <laughs> Fair enough. But as part of the learning events, there is a two day nutrition and lifestyle conference taking place this year on the 9th of September in person in London and on the 9th of November online. Now, anyone can attend this conference, whether you're doing the diploma or not, and whether you are a PBHP member or not. You don't even need to be a healthcare professional. You just have to have that interest in nutrition and lifestyle. Indeed, and the price is really reasonable for a conference that includes refreshments and lunch with early bird for members of plant-based health professionals at only £45 and non-members at £55. So we'll add a link to the show notes for this exciting event. Yeah, and I've had a look at the agenda and it's packed full of great speakers on a variety of topics, including gut health, weight management and mental health which leads us nicely to our topic for today, where we speak with fellow GP and PBHP member, Dr. Ishani Rao, about how our diets can affect mental health. Now, since we talked to Ishani, the British Medical Journal has published an umbrella review of meta-analyses looking at the relationship between ultra-processed food exposure and adverse health outcomes. And unsurprisingly, the review found greater intake of ultra-processed foods was associated with a higher risk of common mental health disorders, including anxiety, depression and poor sleep, as well as all the poor physical health problems you would expect. We do talk a little bit about beige food with Ishani, and we will link that study in the show notes. Now, Daisy, I don't know if you got a chance to see that study, but it was quite incredible how it highlighted some of the figures of how many calories come from ultra-processed foods. Yeah, it's a majority, isn't it? What, what were the actual numbers? Well, I think we always talk about something like, you know, 60% coming from processed foods. But I think on the ultra processed foods, it's quite a range. And across the really high income countries, you find that I think they cited that in Australia, it was about 42% of calories coming from ultra processed foods. And in the USA, it goes up to 58%. Whereas if you compare it to some other high income countries, like Italy, it can be as low as 10% from ultra processed foods. So it's not always about the wealth of a country. When you look at some of the South American countries, Colombia's in there with only 16% of the total coming from ultra processed foods. That's interesting, isn't it? And I think what's really interesting about this whole topic is how food affects our mental health. We talk a lot about physical health, but we're only really starting to understand what we eat and, and the impacts that can have on our mental health. Exactly. Okay, well, let's move on to the interview, shall we, and hear more about it. 
So today we're pleased to welcome a fellow GP and member of plant-based health professionals, Dr. Ishani Rao, who has a special interest in how to look after your mental health as a vegan. And more importantly, for today's podcast, how does food affect mental health? Ishani has a lot of energy on her plant-based diet, combining GP work with public speaking, fundraising for her charity Buckets of Love and leading demands for more plant-based food in hospital canteens. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, Ishani. Thank you so much for having me. I've been so excited to be on the podcast because I've been listening to it so often. So it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for coming, Ishani. Now, of course, you're an NHS GP. So can we ask you what convinced you personally to follow a plant-based diet? Yeah, so I have been asking my parents if I could go vegetarian from the age of about two or three. So when I was 10, they let me stop eating meat. So I still think that they owe me a 10th birthday present, to be honest. About six years after that, they went vegetarian. And then a few years later, I went vegan when I realized that I was trying to reduce the harm that I was doing through diet, but I wasn't quite there because I was still incorporating animal products. And so when I was at uni and we were learning about climate change and unsustainable diets, I realized that I could do that a little bit more by switching to a fully plant-based diet. So I did that about eight years ago. And as they all say, the only thing that I regret is that I didn't do it sooner. Amazing. And so today we're going to unpack some of the evidence behind our diet choices and possible impacts on mental health. So if we can ask you just about food alone, what sort of foods do we have to think about when we think about impacts on our mental health? Yeah, that's a really brilliant question, because I think that there is not enough discussion about the relationship between food and mental health. In university, we did so little about nutrition. And in turn, there was just no relationship highlighted about how that can impact our mental health and how we feel. So there's so many ways that what we eat can make us feel better. And we know a fully plant-based diet can be really beneficial for mental health in so many ways. There's research being done about the gut-brain axis. So this is really exciting. And it demonstrates there is a connection between the brain and the gut. And that could be a physical connection via the vagus nerve, or this can be more of a indirect connection through things like neurotransmitters, which are created in the gut. So there's a link and there's so much research that just needs to be done. We enjoy food, we love what we're eating, but there's so many mental health problems. So is there a relationship and can we be doing more simple things than therapies and antidepressants, such as looking at diet to, to think about how we're feeling? So in terms of the gut-brain axis, Ashani, you mentioned it can be related to neurotransmitters. Do we know of any foods already that have an impact on our gut, both in terms of the microbiome and how that can affect the gut-brain axis? Yeah, so there was actually a really great paper that was was published in the Journal of Translational Psychiatry that looked at the effect of plant-based diets on mental health. And that was the first paper that I saw that condensed this in a really brilliant way with diagrams to show the relationship between the brain and the gut. So if we're thinking about whole food plant-based, then that's looking at eating the rainbow, that's looking at eating a variety of fruit and vegetables and cutting out processed foods, or including cutting out animal products from your diet. And this has been said to have direct impact on precursors to things like serotonin, which is a key mediator in our mental health. 80% of serotonin is actually produced in the gut, which is an enormous amount. So it would be so silly to think that what we're eating doesn't impact how we're feeling. We also know that the gut acts as a kind of second brain, the enteric nervous system acts as a second brain, and that we can actually process a lot of feelings through the gut. So people who have higher rates of things like anxiety actually have higher rates of gastrointestinal symptoms, such as nausea, diarrhea, and things like that. So actually, there's a huge relationship. So when we start thinking about all of the roles that the gut has, such as immune regulation, it can actually regulate your immune system, the production of neurotransmitters, also the regulation of things like inflammation, then there are so many ways that the gut brain axis can be harnessed to be beneficial for our mental health. We should be looking into that. It's really fascinating, isn't it? I think it's an area, like you say, that is still being developed and understood. I mean, from my point of view, I guess my question would be, we know certain processed foods can be harmful and not good for our gut microbiome. But does the evidence already suggest there are 
um, beneficial effects of whole food plant-based diet or is it just the elimination of meat and dairy and processed foods for example yeah so it's definitely a mixture of both when we increase the biodiversity of foods that we eat then this actually contributes to a better diversity of gut microbiome and it's actually the gut microbiome that does things like the digestive processes such as digesting the fiber breaking down the toxins contributing to a good waste system so that it's both sides of it one increasing as much fruit vegetables legumes spices just the variety of whole food plant-based foods but also definitely decreasing those things that decreases gut transit causes things like constipation the buildup of waste products and metabolites but also massively decreases our gut microbiome which makes processing a whole lot more difficult that's really interesting i mean do you think there's enough evidence as a gp to sort of in the consultations to already start talking about food when it comes to a consultation with someone who has anxiety or depression definitely i think a lot to do with mental health and anxiety is that people feel that they don't have a lot of control over things and that's so true when it comes to finances when it comes to social stresses maybe family or relationship tensions health problems there's so many things that we might not be able to control as much as we would like to but when you look at food we have this huge locus of control and I think that that's really empowering for patients so I always try and bring up food because it's something that should be enjoyable it's something that we should have fun with it's something that we should be enjoying socially with our friends and our family so for me that's something really basic that I bring up for people with mental health because it's a double-edged sword the worse mental health problems, the p- more poorly you want to eat and the more you rely on comfort foods and processed foods in general. But actually, the more you rely on comfort foods and processed foods, the more inclined you are to develop things like inflammatory conditions such as depression, anxiety, chronic pain. So it is a cycle, but I think it's a cycle that we can get out of with the right education, with the right tools and with the right knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how would you tackle it in a short consultation? Because like, you're quite right. I have a lot of patients tell me they have the apathy that comes with depression. They're not willing to cook or haven't really got the motivation to look after themselves and you know it's a short consultation what brief interventions do you think we can suggest yeah so we know as gps that we have this framework of things that we go through so we talk about the presenting complaint we talk about the history of it we talk about their past medical history so we've got this lovely framework of things that we run through We also take into account a social history. So where we ask them about drinking, we ask them about drugs, smoking, who they live with. I think a really easy thing to do is to say, how are you feeling about food at the moment? And just throw that in there as a really quick question in your normal framework. And it makes it really easy to fit in naturally. And then it's a really easy way of bringing up the conversation. And most patients will find that actually it's a conversation that they want to have maybe they've not thought about and that they really want help with. So I've compiled a nice list of resources that actually if a patient is interested, I can send them a text and I always try and follow that up to see how things are going. There are also people like the social prescribers and the health and wellbeing coaches that you can put patients in touch with to try and make sure that they are able to follow the healthy plant-based suggestions that, that you want them to make when actually they might have various factors that make it quite difficult. But we have to try and support them as much as possible. And our jobs are to educate them and to just ask if that's something that they if they've ever considered. Yeah, that's really useful to know. Have you got some resources that you could share? The recipes from plant-based health professionals and I always direct them to recipes from the Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine as well. I do direct people to recipes from things like Bosch because I think they're really fun, colourful and cheap. So I try and just tailor it to the audience, but I do try and make it as accessible um, and as fun as possible. And I think that the plant-based health professionals' recipes do that in a scientifically evidence-based way. Can you say more about what physical diseases might be particularly linked to poor mental health? health and therefore how diet might help people that suffer from chronic diseases whether that's things like diabetes heart disease hypertension so high blood pressure there's a significant increase in the risk of mental health conditions as a consequence of these physical conditions so I think the rates are one in two people with a long-term diagnosed health condition are suffering from things like depression and anxiety which is substantially higher than the general population which is still 
still too high. One in about four, one in five people that have a diagnosed mental health condition. So why might this happen? There's so many reasons and there's so many factors that need to be considered when thinking about things like long-term physical conditions. We need to think about whether these conditions are socially isolating. So whether patients might not be able to get out of the house if they have things like poor mobility, if they maybe get breathless, if they have chronic pain as a consequence of these things, are they becoming socially isolated? And in turn, does that contribute to anxiety and depression? We need to start thinking about things like the side effects of medications. So when you read the list of side effects from medications, one of the side effects is always mental health disturbances, insomnia, depression, fatigue. So is as a consequence of the numerous medications that our patients are put on is that things like having to go to hospital appointments having to go to your GP all the time which is so disruptive to your everyday work to your social life so these physical conditions can have a huge impact on how patients are feeling we also know that many of these conditions are preventable with a plant-based diet high blood pressure, diabetes, inflammatory conditions such as arthritis and chronic pain, all of these things can be reversed, slowed down and even prevented by incorporating more fruit and vegetables into your everyday life. So this is a really simple way that one, we can prevent the development of the chronic conditions, but two, if you have these chronic conditions already, we can actually reduce the severity of them and reduce the the symptoms that patients are having. The other thing is, does depression itself cause the development of these diseases? So are there things that you choose to do when you're depressed, such as behavioral things, such as eating processed foods, such as eating comfort foods, such as smoking, drinking alcohol? Does developing depression and anxiety actually contribute to the development of these diseases as well? I worked in the inpatient unit in Bethlehem Hospital, where I've seen what patients are eating, what what patients are choosing to eat that have bipolar, schizophrenia, for example. So this is, again, a really, really vicious cycle that if we help patients and support patients with the right knowledge, the right recipes, and even things like cooking classes we can direct them to. We're able to support patients to break this cycle, to reduce the severity and the symptoms of their diseases, but also to prevent the complications that poor mental health can have on the development of those diseases. Yeah, I think it may shock some listeners to know that people living with severe mental illness have a life expectancy that's on average 15 to 20 years less than the general population because they're more likely to have things like cardiovascular disease a number of reasons for that they might be on medications that that cause them to overeat that increase their appetite you mentioned obviously had had contact with with these sorts of patients in a hospital setting but how do you think we as health professionals can help people with severe mental illness with things like diet and lifestyle? Yeah, it's it's a brilliant question. And it's, as healthcare professionals, knowing that the rates of mental health, whether that's depression, anxiety, OCD, bipolar, schizophrenia, that's increasing on a day-to-day basis. I think that as healthcare professionals, one really easy way that we can try and enter into that chain to try and break it is by educating people and patients from a really young age about how to eat. So I think that we're missing out a lot of fundamental education in schools, in young people. So essentially, people will go for the cheap, processed, salty, fatty meal um, as a go-to, but actually we should be teaching people to become addicted to healthy, colourful foods and to be going for, for the things that will improve your gut microbiome. So I think it's about changing our palates really, really early on to avoid that reliance on the comfort foods, on the foods that we know are safe because we know what they taste like. We know that schizophrenic patients or patients with mental health problems tend to go for the beige foods. And that's often because they're much more predictable they're much more reliable we know that the potato waffles and the chips and things like that they always taste consistent and that can be really easy for people to manage when they've got so many other external stresses so we need to be breaking those habits and breaking those routines really early on to get used to new flavors and unpredictability of a blueberry for example that could be you know sweet one day or sour another day and it's all of these different things that we really need to get used to 
from a, from a young age. And one great way of doing that is doing it in schools, in institutions like hospitals, and that's supporting things like the plant-based treaty, where we know that patients are going to get adequate calories, adequate nutrition, and adequate fruit and vegetables and vitamins from their foods. When I listen to this, I'm like, yeah, this is the right way to do it, which is why it was a bit depressing when in I think in 2017 and 2022 there were some studies that led to some headlines which basically said that um, vegetarians were more likely to suffer depression than meat eaters. Can you unpack where those headlines came from? Do we need to be worried So, you know, we know the headlines on the Daily Mail, we see them all of the time, and often they've read maybe one study, and then they've blown that out of proportion. So I know the studies that you're talking about, and there are some limiting factors that we need to critically evaluate as healthcare professionals. Some of those limiting factors include the small sample sizes of the cohorts that were said to be plant-based, vegetarian, or vegan. So in some of them, 0.5% of the cohorts were actually following a vegetarian diet. So that was really, really minuscule. We also know that this was looking at vegetarians. So this doesn't specifically look at a plant-based diet. We know that they're rising year on year. The last statistics from 2019 said that 3% of the British population was vegan. However, the last statistics that I've seen from 2023 are saying that 4.5% of the population are identifying as plant-based and vegan. So this is growing all the time. So we didn't have the numbers back in the day to actually look at these cohorts and examine them properly. Another significantly limiting factor is that we don't know exactly what these people were eating. We don't know if they were eating processed foods. We don't know what quality of diet. We know from more recent studies that when you look at patients that have a higher intake of fruit and vegetables and are following a whole food plant-based diet, then mental health rates have improved drastically. So when we're looking at the quality of the calories and the nutrition, people that eat more fruit and vegetables are actually suffering from lower rates of mental health issues. So that's really, really reassuring. I don't think that we have to worry about these papers. I think that we have to understand what the limitations are. Another thing that I'd like to mention is that, and I always tell my my patients this, I always tell people this in my talks, is that there are some things that we have to be concerned about and that we have to think about more if we're choosing to adopt a plant-based diet. And that is supplementation. So I know that there was a huge study done by Oxford recently, which was the EPIC study, and it did show predominantly positives. So it showed lower BMI, lower rates of diabetes, lower rates of heart disease in people that were following a whole food plant-based diet, but it did show there was a decrease in B12. So I'd like to just highlight, we do have to think about things like B12 supplementation. I'm very cautious to take my B12 supplement. I take my Veg1 supplement, which has a variety of vitamins in it, and that hits my recommended daily allowance. And another thing I want to highlight here is that it's not just vegans or plant-based people that suffer from deficiencies. I've got lots of patients coming in that need supplementation of things like B12, of folate, of iron. So it's not just a predominantly plant-based problem, but it is something that we do have to think about. And the low rates of things like B12 can have neurological impacts such as fatigue, forgetfulness, brain fog, neurological problems like nerve problems. So it is something that we have to be cautious about. But I think that when the headlines blow things like that up, we need to know that these are very preventable, very avoidable. This is a minority of patients. However, we do need to be cautious with supplementation when following a plant-based diet. Absolutely. I don't think I'm ever going to not need to tell people to take B12 to be honest, because I I, even now I'm still finding people that are plant based, who aren't aware that they should be taking it. I wanted to ask about something that I struggle with sometimes when talking to patients. And that is that for some people, switching their diet will be something quite extreme. And that if we assume that being part of a marginalised group, which of course, plant based people maybe are, If we assume that that can be bad for our mental health because it might take us away from fitting into situations, whether that be a celebratory occasion or maybe just feeling overwhelmed by the idea that we shouldn't be eating animals and, oh, now I've had this realisation, you know, how am I going to process that? Should we be selective in any way about 
who we talk to about eating more plant based and you know how we support those people good question so when I went vegan it was about eight years ago but I grew up as a vegetarian in Spain so that was quite difficult from the age of 10 always on the side salad and chips and maybe not enjoying restaurants as much as other people enjoyed and I did find that quite isolating to begin with. So I completely understand where you're coming from when we're considering if we have to think about that, if communities or people might be isolated and might not have the support network. And there's a few things that I think we have to consider here. Social media is absolutely incredible now. And I understand that there are limitations on access to that, to many patients, especially with the elderly, for example, people that might have visual impairments. So there are communities that we have to think about that might not have access to these platforms that we have access to. But I have found that following things like Facebook pages, Instagram blog posts and things like that to do with plant-based diets has been so helpful with reminding me that there is this huge community out there of people that are also experiencing the same struggles, might be experiencing the same difficulties, might not even know where to start cooking, might think that it's an expensive diet because of the way that the media has portrayed it. So there might be all of these barriers that we need to think about in terms of incorporating people into this into this group which we know has enormous benefits so are there ways that we can then make this easier for people to integrate into my charity buckets of love we have vegan activist well-being days for people that want to think about plant-based diets for people that might be already plant-based and maybe feeling quite isolated so we do things like yoga meditation music therapies massages sharing circles so we have these amazing ways to bring the community together and this isn't just the plant-based community there are people that are interested in this that come to our cinema screenings that come to our gift wrapping for the homeless and feel really incorporated and included and realize that actually we're eating really healthy, really colorful, really easy food. I'm a very lazy cook. So I'm the first person to say, right, we can do this really easily. There must be ways that we can incorporate your favorite foods, but just in an easy, healthy and quick way, because I understand that people have time constraints as well. Another thing that I do with my patients is I always link them with the social prescribers, but also I look at the charities that are available in the area, such as community gardening groups, such as local cooking classes. Age UK are absolutely brilliant. And I'll always send a message first to the people I'm referring to to say this patient is really interested in a plant-based diet. I think that this patient would really benefit from a plant-based diet. Can you help us? And when the people realize that the patient is interested, that the patient patient has said, I don't want to go on medications. I don't want surgery. My diet is really poor because I don't even know where to start. Then actually we can create this community, even for elderly patients that might not have access to things like social media, but there are brilliant ways that we can include patients that might not find it so easy straight away, but to build their community and to think about mindful, healthy, social eating as well. Yeah, that's great. It's about finding like-minded people, isn't it? Very much so and I think that's why things like events and going to community outreach and education events and conferences and workshops and really making an effort even if sometimes I'm tired and I might not feel like it I make the effort to go to these things but also to bring people along as well and there's actually been an amazing paper that I don't think has been published yet but it was by the University of Bath by their Department of Psychology and the Institute of Sustainability and it looks at the public perception at mass gatherings such as vegan camp out it uses that as an example and it interviews different people to say what are your perceptions of events like this and it, it just proves that actually finding that community is so so important and going to the events that you feel like this is really going to strengthen that network of people that can be really vital so I find that that's massively beneficial for my mental health and I also find that bringing other people along that might not even know where to start and might feel really isolated when they're starting on making lifestyle changes that doesn't just have to be plant-based that could be going to the gym stopping smoking going to therapy doing all of these things that might be a big step for people actually connecting people to part of a community can be so beneficial to people's mental health thank you I know and we talked a bit about what to eat and and what's good for our our mental health in terms of food but I've heard you talk about mindful eating um what do you think we need to know about this so this is 
such an interesting topic because I've been quite interested in mindfulness. I think since starting uni and realizing that I had so much brain noise and that I was becoming more inefficient because I think I had so many cognitive functions on the go in the background, much like my laptop does at the moment. For me, mindfulness was a really, really exciting and important way of just reconnecting to the basics in life, whether that is your food or whether that's a walk in the park. I think mindfulness is something that is so valuable to bringing people back to the present and forgetting all of the background noise, worrying about yesterday and forgetting all of the noise that's planning tomorrow but really bringing people back to the present. And food is something that in the Western world, we are so disconnected from where our food comes from, from factory farms. We're so disconnected from all of the toxins, the chemicals, the antibiotics. And we're so disconnected by just grabbing a meal to go and sitting at our desk at lunch and eating it while we're doing three other jobs. And we're not really thinking about what we're eating. We're just eating to kind of survive. And I've grown up in Spain where there's a huge tapas culture. And And my background, my heritage is Indian. So I've grown up in an Indian family where food is so important and we eat with our hands. And I've gone and done my Ayurvedic consultancy in the jungle of India where they would serve soup and there was no cutlery. And so at first I was thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to eat my rice and my soup with my hands with no cutlery? And then you realize you become so much more connected to what you're eating. You're actually touching it. It's the sensation of it being in your hands, of you thinking about how am I actually going to get this to my mouth and what am I eating here what are the textures like what is the taste I'm going to eat this with a group of people that are also having spilling things down their front and dropping bits of rice so it's a much more social approach to eating that we're really missing out on in western culture and I think that that is a major contributing factor to anxiety and depression and social isolation because we're not eating with other people we're not cooking with other people we're not eating mindfully we're eating mindlessly and when we start to eat mindfully that brings this incredible gratitude and connection to our food that then in turn makes us think about hang on a second where is this coming from are there more sustainable ways that I could get this food? Are there more compassionate ways? So actually, when we start thinking about eating mindfully, all of the layers about how food came to be on our plate start to become apparent. And it just gives you this enormous pleasure. It's almost like everything slows down and you can just become connected with the moment in front of you. So I'm a huge advocate for mindful eating. I think it's an incredible practice. Actually, there's really good resources with the British Dietetic Association and Harvard Uni and on Headspace about mindful eating. And I know on the Harvard resources, they mention a plant-based diet and they mention reducing our reliance on animal agriculture to become less guilty and to become more light and to feel more pleasure in what we're eating. That's really interesting because I've always thought of mindful eating in terms of a a tactic to use to not overeat, to sort of be able to um, pick up on your satiety cues and not be distracted by uh, I don't know the TV or the emails or whatever, as you mentioned, scrolling on Instagram. I sometimes do that when I have lunch. I've just admitted that online, haven't I? <laughs> but but you're saying mindful eating in terms of having an impact on our mental health as well. Yeah. So you're. 100% right that for people that tend to overeat, mindful eating can be a really good way to slow down our body and to process when we're feeling full rather than just going for the next bite automatically and wolfing down your food as we would do if we were working or over our debt. So there's that aspect. But for me personally, when I was a junior doctor, I was in my F1 at a hospital which is very understaffed. And I found that I was not hungry and I would just not get hungry because of the stress. I was not eating enough and my weight dropped down. I was on the verge of burnout. I was so close to burnout. And then I realized if I don't look after myself, I'm not going to be able to look after my patients. And I'm not doing justice to my friends and my family around me who are worried about me and who are trying to cook for me and who are trying to look after me. So I realized that I needed to pull my act together and to start looking after myself before I burnt out and I wasn't able to look after anybody. And so there's the opposite side. 
for undereating as well, where I then developed this mindful eating practice where I started thinking about what I was eating. I started really enjoying my food again. I started taking the time to, to plan my meals and to really factor that into a part of my daily routine like I would brushing my teeth, going to the gym. You know, all of these things are basic things that I thought I'm not doing that with regards to food. So it can be a solution to overeating where we slow down that satiety response where where we're feeling like we're full and then there's that, there's that delay in our brain processing to our stomach. However, it can be used in the opposite way as well. And it doesn't just have to be about weight. It can just be for the sole purpose of the fact that somebody is feeling down, feeling depressed, feeling maybe like they can't control other things. However, mindful eating is a brilliant way of bringing that back to the present. And that's for everybody with any mental health problems. I would fully recommend it. Yeah, I can see that actually, because I think if you do mindfully eat and enjoy what you're eating and getting that pleasure, that can really have an impact. And I think, you know, quite often I've finished a meal and I've not even really thought about what I've eaten. So, well, how have I enjoyed it? You know, I haven't even realized I've finished the meal. So I've been so distracted. So thank you for that tip. I'm going to personally take that away and try to reincorporate that back into my life. Let's just change tack a little bit, Ishani. We talked a lot about, about what we can do as individuals, possibly what we could do as healthcare professionals. But what do you think needs to be done in a, on a wider scale? And I'm talking about social policy here. You mentioned a bit about education and how important that is. But what else do you think we need to do as a society to address diets as a driver for poor physical and mental health. Yeah, so this is something that I'm very interested in because I'm doing my master's in global health policy with the intention of changing public perception of plant-based diets and also reducing our reliance on animal agriculture in organizations such as hospitals. This is something that I've really been pushing for the last four years and we finally have some progress and that today is the first day at my trust so Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells Hospital where they're going to be serving fully plant-based meals for breakfast and lunch to all staff so I've calculated that equates to about 4,000 meals that are going to be served today and the the menu is amazing we've got a stall outside I'm wearing my plant-based health professionals t-shirt now just to try and engage with the public try and debunk all of these myths that were so prominent and that can really put barriers up for people engaging with plant-based diets with the terms like veganism people might see that as a dirty word people might not want to eat more fruit or vegetables because they think that you're a health freak or a gym freak so there are so many barriers to this that we really need to to break down we need to do that in a kind compassionate educational evidence-based scientifically proven way so that's where we come in obviously we also need to be looking at things like where the government and where policy changes come into this. And that's where I'm a huge advocate for things like the plant-based treaty. As of yet, it's been about 22 cities eight universities and we know that the 11 New York public hospitals under Mayor Eric Adams have all gone completely plant-based meals so we know that it's possible New York is already doing it they're making massive savings on this to do with admissions to hospital to do with preventable conditions such as the ones that we've mentioned heart disease diabetes high blood pressure chronic pain inflammatory conditions bowel problems cancers there's going to be a huge public health saving when we move towards a plant-based diet so it's about the top-down approach was trying to change policy but it's also that bottom-up approach and we have huge impact as healthcare professionals we have a privilege and a responsibility to be able to have these conversations with patients in their times of need so we've got a huge ability to change perceptions from both ways from top-down policy changes but also from the street kind of activism from the public perceptions from the conversations that we have with patients I don't think that corporations such as the super markets, the government, I don't think that these large scale organizations are going to listen or to become compassionate unless they know that there is a driver for change from the general public. So that's kind of where I'm struggling at the moment is knowing that these huge organizations have the responsibility and they have the ability to make these systematic and structural changes. But I don't think they're going to just suddenly develop a sense of compassion and a sudden, suddenly a sense of uh, responsibility for the environment, for individual health and for global health. I think that that needs to come from us telling the corporations and the businesses 
what we want to see, where we spend our money contributing and supporting local, sustainable, plant-based businesses. And that's a huge driving factor in what initiates change from these organizations. So I think that we should never stop advocating and speaking to people and supporting the businesses and supporting the plant-based vendors, because that is how policy and that is how products are going to change. I love that. It's wonderful. If someone who's listening has been inspired by what you're doing in your hospital, where can they start? What can they do? They want to create a vegan canteen or a vegan day. What, what would you suggest? Yeah, this is this this is actually what I want to help people with doing. So I, how I started four years ago, when there were no plant-based options available, was I went straight to the procurement and the catering services. And I just started emailing them. I started having meetings with them, knocking on their door. We eventually managed to get lots of delicious, free plant-based meals in the canteen over COVID, which was absolutely incredible. I presented this work at the Ecomedics conference in 2022, and they have produced a quality improvement project which you can find on the Ecomedics Bank called the Plant-Based Canteen. They've got a really, really good description about how we can do that if you want to set up something like that in your organization. In short, what I would recommend is going straight to the caterers, going straight to the procurement services, and also now all organizations will have a sustainability lead. And they're very interested. The animal agriculture industry produces more carbon emissions than the entirety of the transport industry. So it would be silly for the sustainability leads to not take notice. So now that's a great group to speak to as well, just escalating it constantly within your organization and find what triggers people as well, because some people won't care about the animals, but they will care about their health. Some people won't care about their health, but they will care about the environment. And when you compile all of the facts, put together presentations, put together recordings of all of these facts and these scientific papers, and then just escalate it. And I think my main tip for mental health is to know when to take a break, when to take a step back and to not feel guilty if you feel like you can't advocate for everything because we're all doing so much. You know, we're we're already trying to encourage people to be plant-based. So everybody I feel is trying their best and then we've got to recognize how we can support these people to make these changes and to not burn out in the process. And actually that's where my buckets of love days come in and where my talks for Vegan Camp Out, they're all about how to reduce burnout in activists because if we burn out then who's going to look after our patients who's going to look after the animals who's going to look after the environment we need to be motivated we need to take the breaks we need to go to the gym we need to take that day off go on that holiday because it's so important for our mental health that's really good advice and if someone did want to contact you if they had questions about this so I'm really easy to find on LinkedIn so that's Dr. Rashani Rao I'm also on Instagram but one really easy thing to do is to just reach out to plant-based health professionals or to Ecomedics, even just on Facebook platforms. I think social media is absolutely incredible if you know how to use it well and if you're following the right platforms. So do reach out to plant-based health professionals, to Ecomedics. We're all, you know, we've all been on this journey. We've all not known where to start. So we're all here to support you, but I'm more than happy to be contacted. One of the things when you're looking for information about uh, mental health and diet is that there isn't that much out there. Where do you think research in this area needs to go? What would you like to see done? What might you like to do yourself? Yes, I'd really like to see more research done on the stratification of unhealthy plant-based diets to healthy plant-based diets, because we know that there is a huge range between what a junk food vegan is eating compared to a whole food plant-based vegan. There's such a huge difference and that can really impact mental health. I still would like to add in here that eating the plant-based sausages and the plant-based cake is all is going to be better because one it's better for the environment two it's better for the animals so you don't feel so guilty and three it doesn't have that inundation of antibiotics used in animal agriculture that are really destructive to the environment as well so I'd say always go for the plant-based cake but definitely in moderation I'd also really like to see more data done on large cohorts And that's just not been possible because there's not been enough of us until now. But with a million more people choosing to identify as plant-based this year compared to last year, I think, according to Viva, that's a substantial number of people that we can get involved in studies. So I'm really optimistic about this. I think there's more and more studies coming out every day. I think that as we realize vegan and plant-based corporations have more money 
to invest in studies, that's going to be really positive as well, because we know that lots of these studies in the past have been funded by the animal agriculture industry, because that's where the money was. However, we know that as we support these vegan businesses and plant based businesses more and more, we know that there's going to be more money to put into funding to put into proper science. So that's really exciting. But I'd really like to get my head around this survey that I would like to do after every one of my talks to just work out how people are feeling, how the, the activist community is feeling, and um, what people's perceptions are of transitioning towards a more plant-based diet. So I'll let you know when I've definitely got that down on paper because I've got so many drafts of it that I've been meaning to send out. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to hear about it, wouldn't we? Definitely. I mean, I think what you said about the stratification of diets is so important because I'm terrified of stuff coming out about people who are on processed vegan diets and there was a really negative opinion piece in the times where the title was, was a horrible title it said something like is this the end for fad vegan diets and of course there was no mention of the whole food plant-based eating it was all about the explosion of ultra processed vegan food and how it would be good when we would got this eating habit behind us so yeah, that distinction is so important in the research. And in order to get on with some proper studies, we're going to need the numbers of people eating differently to get the good cohort studies. That's certainly yeah. true. Yeah, I agree. Well, we're really looking forward to, to seeing what you're going to be doing next, Ashani, where we think you've got so much that you can offer the, the plant-based community. So it's fantastic to have you. Really quickly before you go, do you know what you're having for dinner I tonight? I do know what I'm having for dinner tonight because I don't think I've mentioned on this podcast, but I am actually going to work on sustainability and conservation projects for the next three months I'll be living in a plant-based sustainability commune where I'll be hosting some medical workshops and participating in their second plant-based forest festival so I'm going to be going away for a long time in the next couple of days so that means I've got to use up everything that's in my fridge and in my cupboards every week I do a huge three tray bake so I have three huge baking trays covered in just everything that I've got so that could be chickpeas it could be my homemade kimchi it could be kale it could be broccoli it could be lentils and um, tofu and that will be my kind of buddha bowl which makes about seven eight meals within the week and then I have that with all the different sauces that I've got so at the moment I'm going through a teriyaki sauce sometimes I'll do like a tahini type dip everything's always really pink because I put the red cabbage in my kimchi or I put the beetroot so it's always really pretty as well and it just feels like I'm having a buddha bowl all the time so tonight I will be using everything that's in my fridge before I go and just making it into a huge tray bake covered in all different spices and roasted with a little bit of olive oil and then I just put whichever sources I've got to be used. Sounds lovely. I mean, tray bakes are a really good way of using up what you've got in the fridge, aren't they? Roasting all those veggies and adding whatever you've got. Hummus is another good source to have with a tray bake. We always used to have a big dollop of hummus on top of whatever tray bake veggies we had. Right? Yeah, using Manil's tip of watering it down with some yogurt. Do you remember that one? I did. Well, <laughs> like yeah. a salad dressing. Right. And Daisy, what are you having for dinner? We sometimes make our own pizzas, not not the base. I must say I'm not that proficient. There's two bases we use. I don't know if you've heard of a brand called Crosta and Molica. They've got really nice mm -hmm. um, bases and they're not ultra processed. So they're quite minimal ingredients. And they've actually got a base that's already got a tomato topping on it so it's a really easy Friday night dinner and we can add what we want on it so it'll be a mix of vegetables I, I love mushrooms on pizza you can use vegan cheese if you like sometimes I actually make a vegan cheese sauce and dollop it on so I'll make that with silken tofu nutritional yeast cashews and miso putting a little bit of miso in vegan cheese sauce adds a sort of depth so that's our Friday night fake away not takeaway pizza delicious very nice how about you, Claire? What's on your menu? So I think I I don't know if I'm going to be able to come up with a way of eating it without a knife and fork because I'm quite inspired by this mindful eating because I've actually made a moussaka that we're going to have. But it's messy enough as it is, even getting it onto the plate, those it's layers of potato, isn't it? And aubergine and, and the lentil and tomato sauce. And then similarly to you, Daisy, there's a, there's a sort of cheesy sauce on there, which is the tofu and the nutritional yeast. And it hasn't got any miso in it, 
but that'll be on the top. So I've just taken that out of the freezer already and I've just got to pop that in the oven. Lovely. Well, enjoy and we'll wrap things up here. And once again, thank you so much to our lovely guest, Vishani. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. I feel really inspired and I'm going to take away a lot of what you've told us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. You guys inspire me every single day. So it's been nice to chat to you. Love you. Safe travel. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) 